So hello everybody. Today is April 9th, 2022. We study in our global shots about your gathering on April 11th, 2020. Today's great presenter is Nigel. It's amazing. We're gonna go back to our Hara. And then Nigel tells us Fukushima Hara assessment. I am so honored and so grateful to have Nigel. I called Nigel so many times and he was so busy traveling all over the world and then we couldn't meet. Finally, after 20 some years later, he has the opportunity. Thank you, Nigel, for joining and sharing your precious experience and knowledge with us. Thank you. Thank you, Kumiko and uh, Eva and everybody at Five Lights and uh, hi to everyone. I, I, I get the sense that it's quite a broad spectrum of you all from uh, different places in the world. So it might be a good morning or it might be a good evening or I'm not sure. It might even be tomorrow where some of you are. Anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and once again, thank you to Kumiko particularly for um, seeking me out and, and asking me to, to present something today. Um, I'm it's been very, I would say, it's been very eye-opening and uh, opening in general for my myself to reconnect to uh, the Shatsu community a little bit because I've been sort of drifting over in the, the Campo world for a number of years, which is mainly focused on herbal treatment. And um, of course they are in parallel and they developed in parallel uh, over the many years, but nonetheless, there are some distinctions and differences, obviously. So I still practice Shiatsu very much um, on a daily basis in my life, in my practice, but uh, I don't perhaps do as many floor, full body Shiatsus as I used to. Um, uh, the years go by, so <laughs> we, we adapt, and uh, I'm also an acupuncturist, so I, I kind of have an integration of, um, of different disciplines that I use in my and my treatment work with patients. And that's sort of what I wanted to try to share a little bit of with you today, is this kind of uh, interface between uh, three of the major disciplines in our field, in our work. Uh, that is, of course, Shiatsu uh, itself, and acupuncture, and uh, Kampo herbs, or herbal, herbal medicine. And I thought that one way to do that would be to pick one particular topic where in each of those disciplines, this, this part of the practice is central, is absolutely central, not only in diagnosis, also in treatment, and that is, of course, the abdomen. So all of those three disciplines uh, typically have many different traditions of using the abdomen in assessment and also in treatment. And I thought it might be interesting uh, or possibly useful to, um, first of all, consider a little bit about the history of how that developed through uh, through from China into Japan, of course, um, and then to make some comparisons between the different uh, abdominal uh, work that we do in those three different disciplines. Now, um, principally these days, as I mentioned, I'm practicing Kampo Herb, so the particular Fukushin sequence that I'm using is more focused on gathering information to make decisions about prescribing herbs. However, uh, it, you probably will see from the couple of videos I will show that um, some of the sequencing looks uh, from the outside looks a little similar to uh, what we use in Zen Shiatsu, for example, um, and to some degree similar a little bit to some of the acupuncture palpation of the abdomen also. So hopefully that's not too big a topic, but I'm going to try to focus in on um, that first, uh, going, taking you on a little journey through history uh, from the beginnings of uh, what I appreciate as the beginnings of abdominal palpation and the early understanding of how to use the abdomen in clinical practice and then to see how this developed through uh, more or less 2000 years of history. Um, so I have a little slideshow. I'm going to put it up now. And uh, with Dawn's help, we were trying this before because <laughs> so Dawn's going to be the flying the, the airplane today, as it were. Um, let me see if I can do this. So she's going to, uh, yes, good. She's going to control the slides and I am going to 
do the chatting. So if you don't mind, I, I would I, I would very much like this to be um, you know a two way street and a, a, a sharing uh, opportunity for anybody in the group. Uh, however, I think probably for the slides, let me just do my thing for a little bit. And then at the end of that time, we'll have a, a, a plenty of time for question and answer. Um, let me just check one thing, Kumiko. What what time is there a time that we should uh, be clear to finish? Oh, the end is twelve thirty. Twelve thirty. Okay, yes. that's fine. Okay, so then I'll give myself, if it's uh, eleven fifteen now, I'll give myself about forty forty five minutes then, and then we have a good half an hour for for chatting. I'll probably need my glasses for this part. Okay, so uh, Dawn, we're on slide one. So uh, the title of uh, today's little talk is Fukushin, um, Abdominal Diagnosis in Campo, a comparative analysis. So I'm going to compare the use of the abdomen in, for example, in the herbal tradition uh, in Japan with uh, the traditions of acupuncture or harikyu uh, and manual therapies in general, referred to in Japanese as Ryojutsu, of which, of course, Shiatsu is, is one. Um, so a couple of words about Fuku itself, the first character there. Um, many of you would, would know that that same character has uh, another pronunciation in Japanese, another phonetic sounding out of that character, which is Hara. So interestingly, that same character can be pronounced Fuku or Hara. So we should say something about what is maybe uh, a difference in the interpretation? Because in Kampo, we always talk about Fukushin. I think in Shiatsu, we might, we might more likely talk about Harashin. And so, yes, Fuku is a more, let's say, uh, concrete uh, physical reference to the abdominal uh, area itself, um, almost like a sack or a bag, like, like, a, like, a, like an anatomical uh, encompassing of the vital organs, of course. So Fukushin, already the use of that uh, pronunciation gives you the idea that um, it's probably a more, uh, let's say, concrete, physical kind of exam, which is very true, I think, in the herbal system, as opposed possibly to a more energetic assessment, a more subtle assessment of energy areas of the abdomen in terms of Kyo and Jitsu, for example. So the use of that uh, single character and the, and the way in which we pronounce it, fuku or hara, is, I think, significant, uh, depending on which system uh, or which tradition you're thinking about. Uh, so next slide, please. I'll just... <clears throat> so this is just, uh, of course, a, a thanks to Kumiko and Five Lights for inviting me. Um, that's uh, pretty much we've already mentioned, but I do appreciate this opportunity and uh, uh, my own institute, the New York Campo Institute in New York, um, I'm very honored to be invited here. So here we go. Next slide, please. Uh, is, should be the first admin slide. Yes, good. So um, there we have the two pronunciations of that character. And I wanted to say a few words about these three different uh, headings here, language and terminology, form and function, seeing and, fu uh, seeing and touching, of course. So first of all, um, as I mentioned, the interpretation of whether we sound out the character Fuku or Hara is probably has a meaning uh, relevant to either something more physical or something more energetic. And I wanted to say a few words about, you know, the abdomen in general in Japanese, certainly Japanese culture. Uh, there's a lot of references to that part of the body we're familiar with probably. Onaka, for example, the, the literally the honorable middle um, is a sort of more vernacular way of talking about the abdomen. For example, we might say uh, in Japanese, onaka ga itai desu, my, uh, my tummy hurts, something like that. So sometimes we talk about literally the center of the body in, uh, in the language itself, as opposed to a, a word like fuku, which might mean abdomen or physically. Um, then the hara, the, the, the interpretation of the character hara is much broader than fuku in the sense that it can denote uh, mind or heart or spirit. Hara ga itai desu, my stomach hurts. Okay, that's a physical reference, but we might say something like in Japanese, hara ga tatsu. So literally that means my, my tummy or my hara is standing up. 
that's the literal translation, but you might imagine that that actually conveys an emotion, emotional meaning. Uh, it usually means I'm angry or I'm upset. My, ha my hara is standing up. <laughs> so uh, hara, again, has a lot of different nuances and levels of meaning. Hara ga oki desu, my hara is big or there's a big hara, you might mean that's, you might think that's kind of a, um, you know, an affront, like, oh, that person's a bit uh, fat or something. But usually haraga okides means, uh, again, a more metaphysical meaning, meaning that uh, the person is kind hearted or big hearted or has a big heart, uh, as opposed to, for example, harakuroi, which literally means black hara. Um, and that means like a dark, there's a dark intention. Uh, about that person, there's something not quite, uh, not quite bright or, 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 or clear. Yeah, something, something sinister. We might say hara kuroi, black hara. Um, hara, hara okuru, you have to bind the hara. Um, literally means, you know, you might imagine binding up the hara. The literal meaning is to take courage or, or sort of get oneself into a state of mind and body that is uh, full of courage. So, and then there's, of course, the haramaki, which is these days is the long silk sash that binds the abdomen or goes around the silk kimono to keep it together. Actually, the original meaning of haramaki is, uh, the, is a reference to the samurai armor, uh, the main breastplate, actually, which the samurai would put on from the front, put their hands through and they tie it at the back. So haramaki is like a, uh, you know, this kind of, uh, a protection of the central core of the, the person. So yeah, the term hara is uh, much more profoundly uh, meaningful at many levels than the term fuku, for example, which is much more or simply rather physical. And then even there's another term, uh, tanden, which we're familiar with, uh, dantian in Chinese. So that's a more energetic and a broader area from uh, usually in the lower abdomen, as we know. Um, so yes, there's a number of different terms that we use in the language to refer to this center of our body and the meanings are multi-level uh, from something very spiritual or uh, uh, to do with emotions or feelings to something very physical. Um, form and function, the second term there, um, that's a reference to uh, or in my mind, that's a reference to the correlation or the relationship between one's form, both in practice and just in daily life, and the functionality of the hara, which is to provide a basic force or power in one's life. Um, it's a source of power and it provides a source of expression of that power. And in that sense, we have a kind of a front and a back, a yin and a yang, uh, which we might imagine. So the hara is in the front and the Japanese term for the low back and the hips is, I'm, I'm sure many of you know, koshi, which loosely translates as, you know, hips or lower back. Um, and we talk about in language, for example, uh, hara o dekita, like literally means a kind of a, uh, that person's hara is already made, which means that they're usually actually a kind of a very experienced kind of, um, you know, sensei, if you like. Hara dekita, the, the, the hara is, is, is finalized or finished. They have a finished hara, meaning that they're experienced, I guess you could say. As opposed to, for example, with reference to koshi, we could have in the language uh, yoa goshi, yoa koshi, which means weak, weak spined, or literally someone who doesn't have much courage, right? We're familiar in Chinese medicine, I'm sure, with the low back and the correlation with the kidney area and the kidneys correlation in metaphysics with uh, the will and the willpower, the zhi in Chinese. So yes, those who lack koshi, uh, yo wa koshi, meaning weak back, uh, also lack a kind of sense of purpose and uh, willpower, we could say. So lots of linguistic references to both the hara and the koshi and together they form this uh, relationship between the source of power uh, and the functionality of power. So the form itself and then the expression of that uh, in, uh, in movement and, and life, basically. I have a quick quote that I love from uh, a very good friend of mine, Jeffrey Dan, um, who is the author of um, Koshi Balancing System here in the United States. Some of you may know him, him and his work. And this is a great quote uh, that summarizes this relationship between Hara 
and Koshi. So he says, in the body-mind construct of Japanese culture, we might understand hara both as immovable stability, that is the yang force within the yin abdomen, the visceral center that holds the body-mind focused. And we might understand koshi as the power vector of the structural musculoskeletal center, so much more physical, the yin structure within the yang posterior that puts driving power and rotational adaptability into movement. A uh, lot of long words there, but I love that description as this kind of correlation between the yang structure and the yin potential and their interaction in terms of the strength or expression of the entire individual. So this is a few words about uh, form and function and finally seeing and touching uh, in relationship to the abdomen. Um, it's always been fascinating to me to notice how much in uh, modern medicine, uh, you know, the ocular, the visual aspect of things is so paramount. Um, if you think about the data that we get from or doctors receive from either imaging or uh, blood work or urine analysis or any of the standard assessments of people's uh, health, it's all done visually, right? reading data, assessing data visually. And this is not a this is not in any way a criticism. It's just an observation that we're very heavy on the ocular uh, or the importance of, of the ocular or the visual assessment uh, of, uh, in this case, you know, medical issues. Um, and the Japanese might refer to that more as the scene or the om they have two words that are often used in Japanese culture, omote, which is the scene and ura, which is the unseen. So the obvious and the more subtle. And I think that image of omote ura, that kind of uh, paradox, if you like, and that correlation or relationship between those two is, has a strong, powerful metaphor for us in relationship to diagnosis and treatment in our work, because um, in many ways, the seeing, the looking diagnosis is useful more perhaps for the structural. For example, in, in uh, the use of back diagnosis, uh, oftentimes it's, it's a visual approach to looking at the back and assessing structural imbalances and so on, as opposed to the abdomen, which is almost invariably tactile and we always have to touch. So there's a sense in which uh, this... Excuse me, sorry over... for interruption. I'm um, sorry. Uh, is this the slide uh, that should be on right now? Or should we go... Do we have more oh, slides? Oh, no, the previous slide. The pre yeah, that one. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. We're just, we're just on the last, last of those three titles, seeing and touching. Yeah. Thank you for, thank you for correcting. So I can't actually see the, the slides from, from my screen. So... Um, so yes, this, uh, this uh, touching or uh, seeing diagnosis, you know, visual diagnosis, of course, is one of the four pillars of diagnosis in our medicine, and it's, it's an extremely uh, vital part of what we do. But the touching part is, uh, to my mind, is in a way the most uh, yin, the most uh, receptive. Um, ocular or visual or, or questioning, of course, is the more obvious. These are kind of putting out things uh, into the, uh, you know, towards the patient and getting information back. But the touching is always about uh, uh, receiving and sensing. Um, I have another quote here. I'll just read it. It's kind of, it's kind of beautiful, actually. It's from um, a, a really interesting book by a, a medical anthropologist called, the, uh, she, her name is Elizabeth Sue. She's at Oxford University and she writes very beautifully and, and intelligently about uh, Japanese cultural issues with regard to medicine in general. Uh, she says, in ancient Greece, touch was considered the primary form of sense that belonged to all animals. And that's a quote from Aristotle. Touch and smell in particular, due to the bodily proximity they involved, were sub subordinated to vision and hearing, senses which enable perception at a greater distance. So, you know, the development of human beings and the way when we stood up and we can use this, you know, our eyes, of course, can see at a long distance, whereas smell and touch, of course, have to be directly in correlation with, with the other person or, or the other or the object, basically. In the hierarchy of senses, vision became associated with the superior masculine and touch with the inferior feminine. This is not a, this is just a quote, by the way. In this way, touch became associated with the erotic and affective, so the emotions, 
And on the other hand, touch has also been respected for the authoritative knowledge it generates and the divine powers it can transmit. While optical illusions are easily produced, veracity or truth is often ascertained through touch. And she, ha she has a great uh, little image here. So she says, in the Bible, Thomas did not trust his eyes when he saw Christ, who had just been crucified and buried. He had to touch Christ's wounds to be assured of the, of the truth of the resurrection. Or you can think of, for example, in the Sistine Chapel, you know, the Adam's finger, you know, touching, basically, the transmitting the breath of life, right? So um, that quote just illustrates to me uh, the immediacy of touch and the undeniable truth of what we feel with our own hands. Uh, sometimes that truth is difficult to put into words, but it's a, a direct experience that we cannot deny because there it is, as opposed to the eyes, which, you know, many times can be tricked. Um, next slide, please. Let's just see. Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, so as opposed to Shin, so Hara or Fuku Shin, Shin means diagnosis. I think we know that one of the four pillars are uh, uh, rather important. Uh, I have a quote here from um, a, an, uh, a text from 1800 on the abdomen, which I'll talk about later. The ancients had a saying, diseases reside in the abdomen, and hence the physician must search the abdomen to find the regions of congestion and stagnation. So this is just one quote from one text in the middle of the Edo period in Japan, but there are <clears throat> so many references by so many authors to, uh, and practitioners to the, the hierarchy of the abdomen as not only being the physical center of the body, but being the most reliable through touch uh, way in which we can assess imbalances in the system. And within, uh, certainly within uh, the hierarchy of Campo, um, there is a, a, a preference or a tendency to rely on the abdomen when there is confusion in the process of diagnosis. Uh, I'm sure we all recognize being sometimes a little confused with a complicated patient and we're trying to maybe, maybe some of you, maybe many of you use the pulse also. I'm sure probably you look at the tongue and other aspects of diagnosis that we're familiar with. Um, certainly in Campo, when and if, and it's not uncommon, these sources of information don't always correlate. In other words, the pulse doesn't seem to reflect the same kind of idea as what you're feeling in the abdomen and the tongue looks completely different. And then certainly in Campo, the hierarchy is that we go with the abdominal findings uh, in preference to pretty much anything else. So there is a hierarchy that exists, certainly in, in the system of Campo. Um, and the aim essentially of uh, the abdominal exam is to establish, rather simply, to establish kionjitsu, uh, whether it be in shiatsu or acupuncture or, or indeed herbs. We're looking to palpate both the constitutional strength of the patient to assess whether this person is basically strong or weak, and of course to assess a pattern or determine a pattern of weakness or uh, excess. And that may then depend or relate to certain meridians or organ systems, uh, depending on what um, as, you know what what system we're actually using so um, yes the abdomen uh, diagnosis as the center um, the hierarchy of the abdomen in in relationship to other diagnostic uh, methods and the purpose of the treatment of the assessment of the abdomen is to establish uh, imbalances basically in the flow of energy which is pretty standard next slide please um, here are some images that we may be familiar with the left hand picture there is from the Shindo Hikezushu, which is an acupuncture text from uh, the late 1600s, uh, sorry, the late 1500s, the early 1600s. Um, and it's recognized as uh, belonging to the Mubun school. And the reason I put this up here is because it was the first in, in Japanese medical history, it was kind of the first image that starts to approximate to some of the abdomen pictures that we now see. In fact, I'm sure Masanaga, for example, in his Zen Shiatsu uh, map that he created, uh, must have been pretty aware of this abdomen map also, which is not so dissimilar to some of the locations that, uh, that he uh, developed uh, in relationship to the meridians and the organs. Um, the middle picture is from a text in 1800 I mentioned already uh, called Extraordinary Images of Abdominal Patterns by Inaba Sensei, who was a, 
a, a campo herbalist and that text that single text is very significant in the development of ideas within herbal medicine in japan because it is a text entirely dedicated to the abdomen and the correlation of abdominal findings with specific formulas um, in the campo system so in fact one of the marks of campo is that abdominal findings and patterns that are, associ are associated directly with particular formulas formulations of herbs that then apply to or correlate to that pattern so there's a kind of immediacy rather like uh, Masanaga talks about you know diagnosis is treatment treatment is diagnosis the assessment of the abdomen becomes also the image that you use for the treatment itself um, and the right hand image is rather more simple and it's the oldest image on the page there that comes from the nangyo the uh, Kote Hachijichi Nangyo, which is the uh, classic of difficulties, usually is the translation from the Chinese Han, later Han Dynasty, probably we think around 200 AD. So it's a pretty old image. I'm sure you've seen it before. And it represents a fairly clear depiction of a five phase or five element mapping of the abdomen with the fire, the earth and the water pretty clearly aligned from top to bottom on the midline. And then interestingly, the wood on the left side of the patient's abdomen and the metal on the right side. Um, <clears throat> so these are different uh, eras or different uh, periods of historical development of abdominal thinking, but certainly the left hand one came to influence some of the shiatsu um, and bodywork uh, traditions quite strongly. The middle one is very associated with uh, herbal medicine and the right one came to be the cornerstone for most of the acupuncture assessments of the abdomen actually. Uh, next slide. So a little bit about history here uh, in terms of campo. Uh, so if we go Campo, acupuncture, and, and uh, let's say massage or, or anma, perhaps. So in terms of the Campo development of the abdomen, uh, that derives primarily historically from the Shang Han Lun, which is the oldest herbal text uh, known in uh, ancient China from 219 AD, uh, written by Zhang Zhongjing. I'll show a slide on him in a second. So um, in that text, there are a lot of references to the abdomen in relationship to uh, how to apply that, those findings in terms of herbal prescription. So that's the primary text, uh, historical text, uh, that influenced and has influenced the development of the use of abdomen in herbal medicine in Japan, the Shanghanlun, uh, the Shokan Ron in Japanese, um, uh, usually called treaties uh, on febrile diseases, something like that. Um, in acupuncture, which you remember on your screen would be associated more with the left-hand picture there, the five-element pattern, um, from the Nanjing, uh, from this text in the also the later Han Dynasty China, um, that image or that mapping of the body uh, in terms of em energetic areas and correlations with the elemental forces of the body then uh, became quite fundamental in influencing uh, acupuncture development in Japan. And the, nan, the Nangyo, the, the Nanjing, is full of references to the abdomen, but it's in relationship to the practice of acupuncture. And if we move to the modern era today with uh, meridian therapy acupuncture, for example, which I'll talk about a bit later, um, that kind of influence can be seen very strongly. And finally, the right-hand picture, as I mentioned before, the Mubun style um, uh, depiction of abdominal associations with meridians and organ systems, this came to influence the development of um, uh, bodywork very strongly in Japan from the early Edo period or even before and uh, eventually you know found iterations in the 20th century and different maps of the abdomen that we would recognize now like like uh, Masanaga's system uh, for example so these are the three uh, sort of you know uh, consistent tracks of development from early historical origins um, next slide this is Jan Zhongjing a little picture of him. Um, so he's the guy that wrote Shokan Ron, Shang Han Lun, the treatise on febrile disease. So that's, he is the author of the original text that has strongly influenced uh, herbal medicine in, in Japan today. And his references to the abdomen are uh, still used to this day in, uh, in herbal practice in Japan. Next slide. 
Um, here is the Nangyo again, uh, and this five element picture that has come to influence acupuncture uh, very strongly in Japan. Next one. Sorry, I'm just... Uh... So I've got a couple of slides here on... Um, so I'm trying here to give you a sense of the sort of parallel developments in the different disciplines of acupuncture and herbs and uh, body work uh, of the use of the abdomen. So I'm sort of moving around between the different disciplines. Uh, forgive me if it gets a little confusing, but we're now just looking at some of the early origins uh, or the earliest origins known uh, to us at least historically of uh, some of the bodywork traditions. So this little slide shows you a picture of um, a painted scroll that was found in the Mawangdue caves in 1973. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that just, uh, archaeological discovery, but it was a very significant one in the 70s in Hunan province in the north of China, where they found a lot of uh, silk scrolls uh, illustrating or uh, evidencing uh, some of the earliest, because the, the, the tomb was sealed in 168 BC. So we're talking about the, the Han Dynasty or the late Han Dynasty there. So in that, uh, in those uh, findings was some, this scroll, for example, which illustrates the basic forms of Dao Yin or different kinds of exercises. The literal meaning you see there is to guide and lead or to stretch, um, which became or was really the foundation for the whole Nei Gong, the development of internal martial arts. And later it married, of course, with Anmo, the traditional uh, massage of China, uh, and was referred to as Do, Dao Yin Anmo or Do Yin Ankyo in Japan. So this is an illustration of the importance of movement and exercise and self-massage systems that uh, began as early as uh, almost 2000 years ago in China. And the next slide is related to that same period of time where Anmo, or known in Japan as Amma, of course, the traditional massage system uh, developed at a, in parallel with those uh, Dao Yin exercises and often was, were combined with them. So um, the total system of Do Yin An Kyo is a very comprehensive system of breathing exercises, self-massage, uh, stretching that yoga-like stretches basically as well as massage techniques and practice on another person in terms of um, manipulative therapy uh, so anma of course means press and rub and it later in china at least developed into twina and as we'll see in a minute of course uh, developed into uh, practices like shiatsu in in japan so this is a establishing a strong early a very old link with the bodywork systems of Asia that developed through the centuries. And all of them, of course, uh, focused a lot on assessment from the abdomen, using the abdomen as the basis for treatment, actually. Uh, next slide. This is uh, moving ahead in history. So I'm trying to go chronologically here a little bit. Let me just check on the time, see how we're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so th this is a period of time in Japan around the end of the 10th century. This is a, uh, an individual called Yasuori Tamba, very uh, probably not, maybe not known to, to so many people, but uh, very significant historical figure in Japanese medicine because he uh, compiled in the late 10th century, published in 912, uh, 1998, I think it was, um, uh, this enormous, 984, sorry, the date is there, 19, 984, um, this Ishimpo, this enormous work of 30 volumes uh, describing all the known practices of what had come from China, of course, but within Japan at that time. So that included breathing, Daoyin, exercises, Amwa, manipulative ex work and acupuncture and moxibustion and, of course, herbs as well. Um, so this this is a very significant textual reference in the history of the development of Japanese medicine. Um, and uh, it, it, that's about a thousand, what, uh, 1200 years ago. So a uh, significant point in which we could say perhaps Chinese medicine, as it had begun coming into Japan in the fifth or sixth centuries, 
started to become, we could say, Japanified or Japan, Japanized or however we might, might say that. And this is the first major Japanese author to synthesize and publish information on all of that material, um, Yasuri Tamba. And that actually, that text still exists today in Tokyo. You can go and see it in the National Library. It's a, considered a national treasure of Japan. So it still exists today. Um, it's beautifully illustrated. And, uh, you know. um, next slide. So these are all just little uh, anecdotal examples of individuals or historical texts that emphasize the abdomen. Because in Yasuri Tamba's work, there were several chapters on the abdomen in that text. And this guy, Teika Fujiwara, who is an imperial court poet of the early Kamakura period, so this is like the end of the 12th century. Um, I picked this example just as a, a random example of someone who, in his own diary, and he had this is existing diary that you can, uh, it's, it's still in print in Japan, it's called The Record of the Bright Moon, so the Megetsuki. Um, in his own personal diary, he talks about several encounters with physicians, uh, acupuncturists, and herbalists. Uh, and massage therapists who uh, routinely would palpate his abdomen. So as I give an example here, I called the chief doctor of the Tenya Kuno Kami or the Imperial Hospital, Tanaba Tadamoto, and let him diagnose my abdomen. This is from 1213, so this is old, right? Or another one, I called Shinjakubo, a monk doctor, and let him palpate my abdominal disease. So I'm just giving a couple of simple anecdotal examples here of the fact that the use of the abdomen in routine daily practice amongst the different disciplines in Japan uh, is old. It began from the 6th century. It was uh, clearly um, documented in Tamba's work. And by the 11th and 12th centuries, it was in routine uh, daily practice. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so back to this picture of Mubuns, uh, which is more related to the uh, bodywork school and Isai Mono, uh, Misono, sorry, Isai Misono, who was the, uh, the author of that text in which this appeared. Um, so I've talked a little bit about that one already. This uh, has relationship to both acupuncture and bodywork very strongly and was the first, you know, clear attempt at associating meridians and organs with the abdomen. Uh, hitherto or before that, it was more a simple five element based uh, imaging of the abdomen. Um, and so this was like the beginning of the 16th, 1600s, basically. Next slide. Here's a very important figure in the history of acupuncture in Japan. Um, Sugiyama Waichi, blind practitioner. So a couple of points about that. First of all, he was the first in a long legacy of blind practitioners uh, in acupuncture, of whom there are more than 20,000 today in Japan, by the way, blind acupuncturists licensed, and there are blind acupuncture schools. Um, and similarly in the massage traditions as well, where blind, the blind were very strongly encouraged. It was a profession that was very accessible to them, obviously. Um, so in the 1600s, uh, this guy was attributed with inventing the guide tube, for example, the use of the guide tube in acupuncture and the, therefore the thinning out of the needles. So the characteristics, some of the characteristics of Japanese acupuncture, which include thinner, finer needles using guide tubes was begun at this period of time. But again, I mentioned him because he was very, uh, very strongly uh, focused on the abdomen in both treatment and uh, uh, assessment of uh, imbalances in the body. Um, so again, in the acupuncture tradition, there's uh, uh, plenty of evidence in the Edo period of the use of the abdomen in treatment and diagnosis. Next slide. This is Goto Gonzan. Now we're moving from acupuncture to herbs. This is the father or so-called founder of the Koho Ha, the classical school of uh, Kampo or herbal medicine, which is a school that uh, basically focuses its um, uh, practice on the Shanghan Lun, the teachings of the Shanghan Lun from early Chinese literature. Uh, very pragmatic, not very theoretical at all, and very much based on the Adam. So Fuxin, uh, the development of Fuxin in this system uh, began very much in earnest at this time in the early part of the Edo period, that is to say the mid to late 1600s in Japan. So that's the herbal side of things. Next slide is of uh, a very significant individual in the history, again, of herbal developments of the use of the Adam. This is um, Yoshimazu Todo, and you can see his dates there. He is 
certainly attributed with um jasper could you close the door sorry my son's just come back from soccer um he's attributed with uh actually almost in in an extreme way focusing on the abdomen to the exclusion of for example the pulse he was quite well known for dismissing pulse diagnosis as being too vague and uh impractical and saying that no the the abdomen is the center this is the only way to truly assess the nature of excess and deficiency in the body is from the abdomen so uh, his focus on and, and and attention to the abdomen in his practice was rather critical in the fact that today some 200 years later um, or 300 years later uh, we are left in Campo with a very strong use of the abdomen. So that was quite interesting. And it was synonymous. The reason I put the right hand side picture there is it was synonymous or his lifetime was synonymous with the advent of uh, European, very detailed anatomical textbooks coming into Japan. And it's no coincidence, I think, that at the time in the mid 18th century in Japan, there was this early stirrings, early beginnings of the basis or anatomical basis for Western medicine, which later came in, uh, you know, 50 to 100 years later. Um, and the Campo doctors, the, the herbal doctors, were not opposed to this very concrete, physical, uh, accurate, you could say, assessment of the anatomy of the body, based on dissection, of course. And that's where we reminded when I began the talk today of this development of this tradition in herbs being referred to as Fukushin, a much more practical, much more, sorry, concrete or, you know, uh, sensory, uh, tactile, uh, physical assessment of the abdomen. So when we palpate the abdomen for herbs, we're often using very concrete references to uh, a muscle structure like the rectus abdominis or to the stomach organ in relationship to whether there's water or fluid in there or to this or that other structure within the abdomen as opposed maybe to the energetic areas of the body or the particular meridian uh, level correlations to certain locations on the abdomen, which are much more uh, relevant to the practice of acupuncture and shiatsu, for example. So this is where the reason I bring this slide up is because this is in the, in the history of the development of East Asian medicine in Japan. This period of time is sort of where herbs started to deviate a little bit from the practice, we could call them energetic practices of acupuncture and uh, body work. And they deviated, not in opposition, but in basic uh, concepts and theories. So, of course, acupuncture and body work stayed with the meridian system, the assessment of excess and deficiency, and the use of tactile areas on the abdomen that have energetic correspondences. And the herbalist moved more in a sort of more quasi-medical, anatomical, structural kind of approach to the assessment of the abdomen. So it's an interesting time in history in Japan where that, that sort of separation or you know, division started to happen, actually. Um, next slide. Oh, we can briefly touch on this. Um, I have already mentioned uh, 1800, very important textbook by Inaba Katsubune, uh, now available in English, by the way, um, The Extraordinary Views of Abdominal Patterns by Inaba Sensei. Um, very well worth a look. It is a herbal textbook in, in as much as it refers to the use of and the prescription of herbs in correlation to abdominal findings, but it's the only textbook to my knowledge that is completely and entirely dedicated to abdomen pictures, abdomen presentations, and correlations to treatment directly, in this case, herbal treatment. So a very important uh, uh, textual development in uh, the history of certainly Campo, um, uh, the use of the abdomen anyway. And then his student, uh, uh, Wakuda Yoshitura, um, later published a, a kind of addendum, which is called Fukushō Kira Nyoku, the addendum to that to his teacher's uh, text. So there's actually two texts uh, that are in parallel there that uh, are dedicated to abnormal palpation in Campo, at least. Next slide. So now we'll jump to a little bit of quick history in Amma, and I'm just checking on the time, yes. And we'll close in now. Um, so we have, uh, again, still in the Edo period. So the Edo period, 1603 to 1868, um, 250 years of relative peace in Japan and enormous amount of medical developments happened during that long period of time. 
Uh, and in the bodywork field, certainly you're probably familiar with a few seminal texts and individuals that, you know, ensured the survival of the traditional armor system. Uh, this is one, the uh, Anma Tebiki by uh, 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 Fujibayashi uh, was published in 17, uh, 1799. So in late, uh, late 18th century, still Edo period Japan. So this was uh, a textbook on Anma and a very thorough assessment of that traditional system. So this is textual reference to the uh, survival and practice of Amma in Japan. Uh, next slide shows us uh, a particular focus within the Amma system, which I'm sure many of you know, called Ampku, which is specifically focused on the abdomen itself in terms not just of assessment, but of actual massage itself and, and treatment. And there was a very, a very famous textbook sh by Shinsai Ota in the early 19th century, so about 50 years after the Ama textbook called Ampkuzukai, which uh, uh, ensured, again, the, these textbooks were very important in, in sort of ensuring the survival of these traditions into the 20th and, and, and later centuries, actually. Um, so that's another seminal work on, uh, on Ama related, in this case, Ampku therapy. And then the next slide is someone I'm sure many of you have heard the name of. This is jumping now into the 20th century. So the just at the end of the Meiji period and the beginning of the Taisho period in the 1920s, actually. Um, this is uh, uh, Tempeki, Tamai Sensei, Tamai Tempeki, who published a textbook. Eventually it was published in uh, 1939, but initially he was teaching from it in the 1920s, actually from 1919. And this textbook is extremely important in terms of uh, a kind of synthesis of some of the new Western techniques such as physiotherapy and, and osteopathy and so on, some of the physical aspects of Western trained massage therapists into the AMA system. So he's, he, he sort of attempted to synthesize a number of these techniques and including his explanations of the theory of the practice of traditional massage was also included some Western uh, ideas with that are sometimes a little dubious, but um, nonetheless interesting. So another very important individual and another very important textbook, Shiatsu Ho, um, in the development of traditional massage in Japan. And of course, it was uh, Tamai Sensei who first is credited with using the term Shiatsu back in probably early 1920s, basically. I know Namikoshi Sensei uh, uh, claimed that he coined the phrase shiatsu, but I think uh, most people would, most historians would uh, agree that Tamai Sensei actually was the first person to use that term. So shiatsu itself, the term shiatsu is a relatively new term. I think you probably know that. But, um, and in the modern era, next slide, um, we can see people like Namikoshi. I've just picked a few. There are so many sensei in the 20th century that we could have, I could have included here, but I include two very senior and you know important figures in the development of body work in the 20th century, Namikoshi sensei, of course, and Masanaga sensei. Uh, pretty different styles. Many of you will know the difference, I'm sure. Um, but in terms of the use of the abdomen, once again, particularly uh, Masanaga Shizuto, um, his you know sense or sensibility of not only the way that the hara is used in practice for the practitioner, but also the, the specific use of the abdomen in assessment and treatment was uh, really paramount. So that's a little bit about um, you know bodywork development in the Edo period and up to the present. Um, and flicking back for a moment to acupuncture in the modern era, this uh, on the left we've got Yanagi Asore, who is basically credited with you know uh, I think. Um, making sure that acupuncture didn't disappear in the early part of the 20th century. Um, luckily, he had a number of people he was treating in high places in the government, and they, they managed to, to keep it because in the late uh, 19th century, the Meiji period, they tried to outlaw acupuncture and were almost successful, but it managed to maintain it. So he was a very strong figure. And again, in the, in the you know, revival of, of acupuncture in the modern era, um, and he created a, a movement called Keira Kachira, which is Meridian Therapy Acupuncture, which again, I mention here because the abdomen is the core and primary assessment tool along with the pulse uh, for uh, the practice of acupuncture in that system. And the most well-known uh, surviving practitioner of that system is Shudo Denmei on the right there, that's his picture 
he's still he's still alive in his 80s in uh, in Japan and practices the same style. So uh, abdomen palpation is uh, is a is a is a big feature of that particular style of acupuncture, which is actually the style that I myself practice. Um, and there is Dr. Otska, who is possibly the most well known. I'm moving now from uh, body work to acupuncture and now back to herbs um, in the 20th century. So his dates are 1900 to 1980, one of the principal proponents of Campo in the modern era and probably almost single handedly responsible for um, allowing Campo to, you know, enjoy a revival in Japan and find its place in the in the medical system as it is today. And again, he was uh, trained in what we refer to as the modern kohoha, the modern classical tradition, which places the abdomen at the very top of the hierarchy of uh, diagnostic and, and tools to, uh, in, the, in the practice of herbs. So very influential figure in his textbook, um, myself and my teacher translated some back in, 19, in 2010, I think it was, um, uh, has a big section on the abdomen in that in that textbook actually and then very briefly the next slide I'm just including a little picture of um, myself uh, so we're going sorry to yeah next slide again sorry Dawn I forgot to thank you yeah so I'm uh, not to blow my own trumpet but that's my my little contribution to to this particular topic, um, which was published pretty recently. Um, and again, it's if you have any interest in some of the things I've been discussing, particularly the comparative aspect of, of uh, body work, acupuncture and herbs in Japanese medicine with regard to the use of the abdomen, then you might find that text uh, somewhat interesting from both a historical but also practical perspective. Um, I think at this point, I'm going to ask to unshare the slides if you would dawn and bring everyone back because i see the time is just around 12 and i'm respectful of everybody's time here so we've got um as i promised around now to leave plenty of time that's uh a, a rather a rather abstract i know sort of foray or little journey through history um, we're all practitioners, we're interested in practical things. On the other hand, this is Zoom, and it's a little bit more difficult to actually demonstrate a lot of things. I do have a little video of, um, a couple of videos actually, of the particular abdominal sequence, the Fukushin, uh, that I use in my herbal practice. And I'm going to show those in a minute. So don't be, uh, don't think that we're not going to at least see the actual movement of the sequences. Um, but I just wondered if there are any uh, comments or, or questions or, yes, contributions from anyone in the group. I'd love to hear at this point. Um, and, and then we can go back and have a look at that, the actual sequence itself. I've done all the talking here. Randy, you know I'm going to pick I just want to say it's been a wonderful... Uh, overview historical wise of, of all the this development super thank you yes thank you okay so no other i thought I there might be some there are some questions in the in the chat room oh, in the chat yes yeah. okay let's have a quick look here um I usually read the questions from the chat. Okay, but, go ahead. Uh, yeah, please, please. I Thank you. Those Eva. questions, um, no problem. Those questions were regarding what you were uh, talking about at the moment. So, Sophie, uh, no, no. Uh, Viola said, which of these do you consider most accurate? So I'm not sure at what which point he did ask that question. I think it was about the uh, the. Uh, the Fukushima the charts the charts for the the, the different part the oh. two pictures of the abdomen differences yes. yes I see you mean maybe the five phase representation versus the the Mubun picture which often is used in Shatsu books actually and then the the campo stuff yeah well I mean I don't think it's a matter of which is more accurate these are these are from different traditions 
So, of course, they have a slightly different purpose in terms of their clinical interpretation. So they're, they're all useful in their own way. Um, they're, just, they're just running in parallel. So, I mean, I'll try to give you, I'll give you a physical or concrete example. Since I practice acupuncture and shiatsu and herbs, um, what I tend to do, otherwise I find myself going a little crazy, is I keep things a little bit separate. So when I start my work, I'm usually taking the pulse because my first round of needling, my first round of acupuncture is based on the pulse point. So usually when I start a treatment, I don't palpate the abdomen straight away. And then when those first round of needles come out, I'll palpate the abdomen. And then I have a kind of a different cap on, which is in regard to uh, the herbs and the herbal thinking. So um, I'm just trying to illustrate there that I don't, I don't try to make them all fit together. I consider them in their own right, uh, useful in their own way. So you, I don't know, some of you may be Zen, Zen Shiatsu practitioners, and so you'll be familiar with uh, Masanaga's work and the use of the 12 locations uh, corresponding to the meridians and the assessment of Kyon Jitsu, and that's one way. Um, but there are, there are parallel ways of using the admin, and uh, it's not a matter of which one is more accurate necessarily. Um, the main thing I tried to illustrate in this uh, little chat, though, was that the herbalists in Japan definitely took a route that is more kind of anatomically based. So if your tendency is to be wanting to be a bit more sort of anatomically precise, then that system kind of correlates quite well with that way of thinking. Um, and in fact, as you probably know, many MDs, medical doctors, practice Kampo in Japan today, and they generally don't have a very thorough understanding of oriental medicine as a whole but they they often do palpate the abdomen and they're quite good at it so they they have a more sort of structural approach to things whereas if you take japanese style acupuncturists or or, or shiatsu therapists for example we have a we we often have a more energetic uh, slightly more subtle often softer lighter pressure approach to the abdomen so these are all different approaches they all have their validity um, I would suggest that in practice, it's not always easy to make them all fit together. We probably have to keep them somewhat a little bit distinct one from another. I don't know if that's an answer, but hopefully yeah. that will. <laughs> Eva, were there any other questions? Uh, no, there was an impression from Dawn, uh, she said, uh, reminds me of Chinai Tsang. Oh, uh, yes. Yes. I think that's the that's a Hawaiian massage, I believe, in, in origin. Um, yes, like from the um, yeah from Hawaii, basically. It's I've had Chinitsa a couple of times. Very intense abdominal work, actually. Uh, you know, one hour of working on the abdomen. <laughs> you feel uh, I sometimes feel a little bit kind of you know afterwards. Um, but yeah, I'm not very familiar with Chinitsa, but I've certainly come across it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I've got a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Hi, it's Brian. I have a question. Yes, Brian. Um, first of all, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Uh, but at the very beginning, when you were talking about how we receive information, you'd mentioned uh, touching always is always about receiving. And I, I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit. And is that that's not completely what you feel about touching? I'm sure that touching is always about receiving. Mm. Certainly, it's a two-way street. Yes, no, that's a good point. I mean, I always, I always feel like when we're in contact through touch, the mind is often tending to look for something, right? Like a, there's a searching, inquisitive aspect, which I would agree if that's the state of mind we're in when we're touching, then in a sense, that's a yang form of assessment, isn't it? It's, a, it's an active form of looking for something. So there is that kind of touch and certainly part of the touch that we use both on the abdomen but anywhere on the body is inquisitive and is somewhat searching or looking or yes um, and that's sort of more proactive but I think um, uh, probably Masanaga has the best way of describing the the kind of listening part that I was describing before which is the mother hand right the in hand that the, the supported hand that is static usually and that's that's a listening part. So I would agree with you. I think it's both. There's aspects of touch that are part of an investigation, if you like, or a looking or searching. 
um, and there's a there's a part of touch that is much I, w I will definitely not use the word passive but I will use the word uh, listening and static and attentive right so I think those two things go on pretty much all the time hopefully together and in, in unison when we're touching a patient yeah listening yeah. and doing yeah it sounds like you're addressing though uh, the perspective of the uh, the practitioner I was thinking more uh, that touch is also communicating to the receiver I see what you're saying yes um, I was always certainly in my in my shiatsu training uh, and my teacher was uh, Suzuki Sensei Suzuki Takeo who was uh, a student of Masanaga's and initially took over uh, yokai actually initially in, in, in Tokyo for a while um, he was very emphatic about the experience of the receiver as being one of first of all the inability to I guess one of the three principles that Masanaga teaches in the, in the principles of pressure is this kind of equal pressure right and what is equal pressure other than a kind of bringing together of points of contact it could be two points it could be more than two points maybe your two hands and a knee or an elbow and a hand or bringing together those points of contact as in terms of the patient or recipient's experience as an indistinguishable uniform experience mm -hmm. whereby if they were to open their if, if they were to close their eyes uh, or keep them closed they couldn't or wouldn't be able to distinguish which mm -hmm. points of contact are where like a kind of a, a universal feeling so yeah. actually uh i was always uh, uh, under the impression that um an aim in body work or an aim in that particular style of shiatsu anyway was never to really give the patient a sense of deliberate kind of didactic touch that never that the person that the patient should never really feel that sense of someone looking for something in their body but that they would feel a completely uniform almost dissolved uh you know universal feeling almost like one one point like Suzuki always used to talk about one point two hands one point one point one whole feeling right so but, yeah. but isn't that the isn't that the ultimate two-way communication uh maybe I think I think in in that sense it ceases almost to become two-way doesn't it it's almost like yeah. a, it's there's like no a, duality it's, it's, it's like just a, right. one, well it's just one touch I it's, like it's like a fusion yes I agree I mean we can it's we can talk about it. it's very difficult to talk it's very easy to talk about it but the experience <laughs> hopefully all of us have had these experiences and it doesn't have to be even with another person right in meditation there's mm -hmm. there's moments where one could reflect later on that oh there was a moment there where I was completely you know there was no me something like that you know that feeling yeah well thank you very nice lecture thank you so much yeah um if there are no other, if there are no more questions then I will I think we should, I should at least you should have a question oh please hi Nigel um hi. Uh, you, you've covered it a little bit but um if you have any added comments with uh, all your practice of mixing shiatsu and acupuncture and herbs, um, wait I'm for the sorry, ambulances. This, we're, we're, <laughs> it's New we're York. In, we're in New York. Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, it's, um, I know that Martha has, has talked to me a lot about it, but how can you separate? shiatsu from your your practice of acupuncture and herbs is a is the fukushin a way of, of of putting it inside with your practice it's it's there's like so many branches of tcm mm -hmm. and um here in quebec we have to separate shiatsu from acupuncture right i remember that and martha told me that yes yeah so how how do you see that everything fitting in together the shiatsu the fukushin the acupuncture and the herbs well that's a really in good your question. practice <laughs> that's a really good i mean I'm, I'm a bit um i'm a bit torn in answering that question because part of me i mean just to reflect what i do in my daily work i do i do include those three disciplines in almost every session i do with a client or a patient 
So most of my patients do get herbs, not all of them, but most of them. And during a session of an hour long, they will get acupuncture and shiatsu combined. So that's the reality of how I work. And I've, I, it's rather hard to describe how that all works in terms of you know, mechanics, but they're all in there. Um, there's another part of me that is quite happy when I am able to distinguish things. Like, for example, I do have some patients who come only for herbs and they will be on the table briefly because they'll palpate the abdomen but mostly we're sitting and talking which is a kind of herbal approach to assessment um, versus maybe a shatter treatment where i'll work on the floor and do a full hour body you know four position body treatment uh, with no needles and no herbs so i quite like the purity of doing you know doing one thing at one time uh, but the reality of my practice is it's usually kind of incorporated um, I think the only thing I can say about what's important to me in that is not to necessarily make all the different um, bits of information that are coming at me from different methods and different disciplines, make them all fit. I think that's really quite hard to do. But to try to carry over a consistent approach to the whole treatment and the whole, the whole way in which you're dealing with a person. By that I mean... Um, basically trying to be present to the to the individual the whole time so whether you're doing whether you're performing a fukushin that belongs to a herbal tradition or to acupuncture or to shiatsu the quality of the pressure and the intentionality of the, of the what we were talking about before making the connection with the other person and kind of really getting in there height them us going in it, it there's no difference in that sense uh, and i'm not sure if i'm really speaking to your question clearly but um it's yeah it, it's not easy to make all the theories from those different disciplines fit because many times they're actually sometimes in opposition so i wouldn't i wouldn't expect perhaps if you're practicing more than one discipline for everything to nicely fit together uh, as one thing that doesn't always work that way but so in that respect it would be important to make a choice uh, in, in respect to which one you're going to follow. But there should be a consistency, I think, of approach in, across all those disciplines. So, for example, the way in which I handle needle, the way in which I touch the body when I'm needling, to me, is very similar to the way in which I touch the body when I'm just using my hands, which is very similar to the way I palpate the abdomen when I'm thinking about herbs. So in that yes. respect, there's no, there's no real separation. Do you know what I mean? I know, Nigel, it takes years of practice. <laughs> There's some other people raising their hands. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I wonder how do you, uh, it's the same question, how do you combine it? Because to, to work with the needles, you people have to be undressed, no? Yes, that's and true. And with your abdominal uh, diagnosis, uh, diagnosis also, but do you, how do you, how is your shiatsu done? How do you work? Yes, that's a good question because I have had I have adapted my shiatsu within a within an acupuncture session uh, to be pretty focused on actually jitsu kind of approaches. So often, but it's on the bare skin. You you work on the skin. You don't work. No, with no I don't work on the skin. No, when I come to the, I usually do the shiatsu at the end of a session, the last fifteen to twenty minutes. I'm usually working in the prone position, not always, but usually. So this is within my own. So I've done a lot of, um, that's a good, I have to be a bit more specific. The first round of needling for me when I'm using needles is very similar to working on the kyo in the Masanaga system, basically. So I'm actually using needles to, balance, to attempt to release jitsu and fill kyo in that first round of needling. So when I get to the shiatsu part of what I'm doing, I don't actually work on the kyo so much with my hands or my elbows. I'm working more on the jitsu at the end. So they're like 20 minutes or so, I'm working usually prone position. In that case, I cover the patient with a towel always or a sheet. Oh. So you know, I'm, working, I'm not working on the bare skin. No, I never do that. Well, Nigel, yeah. can we watch the video? Maybe they can understand. Yes. Yeah, sure. This is just yeah. for the abdomen, okay? So if yeah. you want to, Dawn, if you don't mind taking us back to the the let's see to this slide which is the one of the abdomen actually can you find it i 
think you have to share it first. Are you able to see it, Kubiko? On me? No. No, I can only see you. No, so that, that's not good. Download. It's, it's you coming along. Just have to open up again. Oh, just okay. No problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe just... a second or so. Yeah, take and meanwhile, maybe you can answer the question from the chat. Uh, yes. There's a question about uh, if you do you have a system to diagnose from a remote distance? No. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> uh, I. You know, I've I've tried that. <laughs> I'm not very good at it. I don't. I think there's uh, my teacher Suzuki Sensei was actually quite good at that. Um, he he didn't teach. He did never attempted to teach that. I don't think he he thought that it could be taught. But he I saw him do it a few times. I had a very close friend of mine, Veronica, who studied with me with Suzuki for many years, and she's back in London now. Um, she actually took over my shiatsu school there, and she's still running that. Anyway, she was very close with Suzuki, and uh, one time she was visiting England, uh, and I was in regular class in Japan with Suzuki, and he was. Uh, it was at a certain point in the class he was feeling his own. He was feeling his own meridians basically, and he just said something very idly like, uh, "Oh yeah, Veronica, Veronica's sick. Yeah, she doesn't feel too well. I think she has a she has flu or something like that." And then we just went on with the class. And I spoke to Veronica that night in London, and in fact, she 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 was in bed. She was sick. It was kind of interesting. So he did very random things like that that were kind of totally unexplained, um, very interesting, slightly kooky, but uh, definitely you know compelling. Um, so I've seen that done, but I have never attempted. I've attempted to do it, but I'm not. No, I don't do that. I don't do a, a distant um, assessments. No. All right, so what we want is that, oh, right, you're going to the, yeah, go all the way to, good, good, keep going. When the abdomen picture comes up, there it is, perfect. So now what we'll do is, yeah, no, that's good. So this is a typical sequence uh, from uh, Fukushin in the uh, campo system, in the herbal system. Unfortunately, you can't see my other support hand, which is on the patient's right shoulder. So here we're palpating the epigastric area. This corresponds to certain specific herbs, if there are findings there, the hypochondriac area left and right, or right and left. Here we're percussing for gas and water. Here we're palpating the trajectory of the rectus abdominis muscle on both sides. Here we're pulse, palpating for pulsations along the midline, beside the navel and below the navel. Here we're palpating the midline below the navel for strength and tonus. Here we're palpating for blood stasis beside and below the navel. And finally, midway between the navel and the ASIS. This is the last part of the exam. And then we finish. I've got another. Um, Dawn, if you want to un unshare that one, and I'm going to share my screen for a second. Okay, let's see. Here we go. Uh, so that was that one. Let's try this one now. Um, okay. So this is another view 
of the same exam. You can see a little bit more the posture uh, involved here. So, first touch, epigastrium. Hypochondrium. <coughs> Percussion of rectus. Pulsations. and Oketsu. <coughs> yeah. Um. Okay. All right. Um. So I, I realize obviously that that's just a little video. It's a bit secondhand. I mean, I wish there was a more direct way to demonstrate to you, um, obviously in person. <laughs> um, that's just the herbal assessment uh, technique that we use um, for, and each of those findings, whether it be epigastric, hypochondriac, percussion of the stomach area for gas and water, rectus tension, pulsations on the midline, oketsu, things like that. Each of these findings, um, correlate typically specifically in their grouping so if you get two or three or four findings together they often match or correlate to a specific formula a specific herbal formula that we will prescribe so there's a kind of a system in the herbal tradition of, of campo that you you match abdominal patterns or pictures with specific formulations or at least families of formulas so it's a it's a very kind of direct way to move from assessment to treatment actually directly just as there's, just as Masanaga always talked about in terms of diagnosis is treatment. I mean, when you're, when you're palpating the abdomen and you have a sense of cure and jitsu, you already, you already know what to do, right? <laughs> you're already going to work on the cure and release that jitsu. So there's a correlation between the assessment and the treatment, which is immediate and direct, which, uh, which means that you don't have to abstract too much into your mind and theorize about, I don't know, patterns, you know, abstract patterns of pathology or something like that. It's directly from the hands into the sensibility of your whole system, directly out into treatment straight away without really kind of processing too much. So that's a kind of, I think a hallmark of most of the Japanese systems, whether they're acupuncture or herbs or, or shiatsu or bodywork in general, is that kind of, I wouldn't say absence, but a reluctance to get in your head, right? It's like direct sensory uh, assessment that translates into movement and 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 doing basically so doing and being yeah. same as sumo wrestling yes 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 not very yeah. heady not too much you know intellectual you know now i'm going to do this or now i'm going to do that or no no it's just like <laughs> yes anyway i hope i'm i don't want to keep you much longer i know we're almost out of time i i really appreciate this opportunity it's a bit um this this medium, we're doing our best, and I think it's so great for Kumi, that Kumiko's initiated this amazing thing over the last two years of a possibility of seeing all the different teachers and maybe getting a little flavor of things that lots of different people are doing. Um, uh, of course, it's limited in terms of the content. I apologize for that, but uh, hopefully it's been interesting, and um, I, I've enjoyed it a lot. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Wonderful, Nigel. Thank you, Nigel. Yes. Thank you, Nigel. That was such an interesting lecture. Thank you so much. I'll be quoting you in our future uh -huh. social media yeah. posting. <laughs> Thank you so yes, much. This is Nigel's information. If you have any questions, please contact him. He's going to be there for you to understand better.
Fukushima, Campo, and Oriental Medicine. So enjoy every moment you have. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining yeah. today. And Thank see you very next much. week. Goodbye. Oh, we have a Patricia's presentation. I hope Nigel can do the presentation as well on Monday at 10 o'clock. Hado Shiatsu. And we will continue our global shiatsu gathering next Saturday. It's Karim. She's going to talk about importance of hands and touch, transmitting energy to your own family, babies and the kids. Join us next Saturday. So see you, everybody. Thank see you. you. Thank you. That's it for all. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs> Can we do? I can we? Can we could have time? Can we stay and talk a little bit after? Yes. Okay. Yay! All right, Octavio. Hi, Natasha. You okay? Yeah. Good. Yes, I'm okay. Thank you. Good. 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 Natasha, Natasha, good see you next Saturday. Oh, Jane. Hi, Jane. Thank you. Oh, Daniel, how's Daniel? Is he okay? He's okay. Yeah. Good. He just he he just passed the herb exam, TCM herbs. Wonderful. And now and now we're in a group trying to learn Campbell. Wonderful. Invite Nigel. He's gonna. Yeah. Yeah. We're good. thinking of that. We just ordered his book. Oh, Hasn't come yet. Great. Great.